Hey everyone, Rob here from Gunfather Milsim, and today I'm bringing you my first impressions of the Silverback Tech 41P. Uh, real quick, for those who are new to the channel or whatever, my background is I've been playing Airsoft since about 2008. I've been a SWAT officer since 2009 and a SWAT sniper since 2015. So I bring a lot of perspective from both sides of the, the aisle, the Airsoft side and the Real Steel side. Um, do quite a bit of airsoft sniping. I've traditionally, I used to use a VSR-10 for a very long time, and then I switched uh, a couple years ago to an ANK M24, which is a much more affordable platform, and they only cost about $120. And this is my first uh, dive into the Silverback sniper rifle collection, and uh, these are obviously a little more expensive. This one was $400 on e-bike. So just giving it a try and seeing if the money is worth it. So I'm going to give you my first impression and critique to this gun based on the fact that it costs $400 and not like $120. So my expectations are a little bit higher than your typical airsoft sniper rifle. Um, initially, some people have said it's, it's particularly heavy. I don't believe it's heavy at all. I think it's, it's actually very, it's quite light as most airsoft sniper rifles are. So let's talk about the externals real quick. Now you'll see that this one has a Vortex diamond back. 4 to 16 scope on it. Uh, obviously, I bought that after the fact and threw that on here. That's just kind of my go-to scope. This has been on several airsoft sniper rifles. It works very well. Um, the rail system is a standard Picatinny rail. Gets this mounted up there, no problem. Um, talking about the externals, the barrel and the receiver are made of aluminum. And as near as I can tell, I put a magnet on it, it didn't stick. That's common. Lots of airsoft guns are made out of aluminum. The receiver in particular appears to be fairly well made. It's, uh, it's, it's very thick and durable. Um, I think it's going to hold up fine in the long run. The stock is very similar in appearance to the uh, same one I use on my real world SWAT sniper rifle. Um, but this one is very light where that one is, is quite heavy. That one's on the APA American Precision Arms Paragon is what I use at work. So the aesthetics are very similar and that's, that's one of the things that kind of attracted me to the gun. But that's kind of where the similarity ends is, is is in the aesthetics. Um, this stock in particular has really cool, okay, we got M-lock attachment points on both sides. Um, we got two on the bottom. Uh, personally, I would prefer to have just a simple uh, sling stud. Yeah, I can get an M-lock one, but I would prefer to have at least one sling stud in here. Not that you're gonna use a sling stud much in airsoft, it's just nice to have. Uh, we have QD mounts on both sides and the front of the stock and QD mounts on both sides of the rear of the stock. And we also have this adjustable comb height, which is a nice feature. Um, it works. You tighten it down and it sits tight. I, I like that. Uh, it came with, uh, I think, three or four spacers in here to adjust the length of pull. Uh, for me, the, the stock it came with, stock length pull, works just fine for me. So I kept it that way. That is about it for just the simple externals. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the issues I had with it after initially receiving it. First one, okay, see here, no cover, no barrel cover, no muzzle device of any sort. It came with an orange tip that was pinned on here. They actually drilled a hole in the uh, threads there. And uh, removing that wasn't terribly difficult, but I have access to probably a lot more tools than most folks. I actually used a hot knife to cut through the plastic and cut that out of there and then pull the pin out. But there was no, you know, regular full metal replacement in the box. I had to order one of those on e-bike. I think it was like $15. It's on its way. Is that the end of the world? No. But for $400, I would expect that to be included. Next thing I noticed, if you look here, this is a free float barrel. That's kind of cool. Uh, but if you look closely, you'll see that movement. Okay. That isn't the barrel moving. That's the handguard moving. So whatever polymer rubbery type stuff they made this handguard out of, it really isn't that stiff. And down here, we got quite a bit of movement. Now, is that the end of the world? No, but if I'm using this as a sling attachment point, I would like that to be a little bit sturdier than what I'm seeing here. Also, if you look under here, under the grip, see this big open hole here? Um, why is that there? I would like that to be <laughs> covered so I don't get dirt and grime and crap up there. That's you know, once again, for $400, that should not be exposed and open like that. So that's all I got on the externals. And to be brutally honest, when I first pulled it out of the box, looked it over at that point, I was a little bit disappointed. Um, for the price point, I really expected better. 
But then when I started really looking into the functionality of the gun and how it plays on the field, that's where the TAC-41 really starts to shine. First, let's talk about this magazine. First thing you'll notice is it's where it should be on the real firearm. It's underneath the action, not underneath the hop-up as it is with like a VSR-10 or honestly most airsoft sniper rifles. How do the BBs get from here to there? Well, there's a feed ramp in here that goes from the magazine to up to the hop-up unit. So you pull the magazine out. This thing is really thick plastic. It's really robust. It's really well made. Um, it's, it's awesome. I, I love this magazine. It holds 48 BBs, which is quite a few. You compare this to the A&K M24, which is my old snap rifle, the magazines were garbage. They were cheap shit, and they only held like 20-some BBs. Huge improvement. Now, when you load this magazine, it makes a definitive click. And then if it were loaded, you'd hear those BBs kind of feed up into that feed tube, which holds 28 BBs. Then you pull this back out, and I reload it up to the max of 48. So then I got 48 plus 28. That's 76 BBs that you bring to the party all in one magazine. That's quite a bit for an airsoft sniper rifle. These are also pretty affordable. They cost 16 bucks a piece. I bought two more, so I have a total of three. Um, that's, that's a lot for just three magazines. You're bringing a lot of uh, ammo to the field, okay? So the magazine, huge plus, huge improvement. Um, from fielding it, it, it feeds every time. I haven't had a single misfeed with this gun. Just awesome magazine design. Next, let's talk about the hop-up unit. This gun comes from the factory with a top dead center mod. Your hop-up unit is on top of the barrel, okay? And it's got this little dial here that's got a bunch of numbers on it. And when you dial it in, you can hear the definitive clicks. Hear that? There's good solid clicks and it stays put, it stays set. Most airsoft sniper rifles have their hop-up adjustment is on one side or the other. It causes uneven pressure on the BB, which means they're gonna curve. Uh, VSR 10s notoriously curve left. So you always gotta do this top dead center mod after the fact, okay? Silverback was smart enough to say, hey, we're gonna give you this from the factory. Now, how does the hop-up unit perform? Well, I got on some Facebook groups for this gun before I purchased it and said, hey, what kind of hop-up rubber am I gonna to need to put in this? What performs best? And most of them said, don't change it. Use the factory one, it works great. And I found that to be true. So that's awesome. From the factory, this thing's ready to go. Don't have to modify the hop-up at all. The hop-up is critical when using an airsoft sniper rifle. Basically all your accuracy, all your range, all your performance is gonna come out of that hop-up unit. And this gun comes with an excellent one. Now let's talk about the bolt. This gun just cycles smooth, okay? It is just solid. And yes, I know you're not supposed to dry fire your airsoft gun, but I'm making a video. It'll be fine, trust me. Um, traditionally, like a VSR-10 or an AKM-24, you always gotta support the back of the bolt like this in order for it to move smoothly back and not have any sort of wobble in it. It's kind of annoying. This has a lot more material there. It's a much larger bolt. Um, it's, it's a much larger cylinder. It just feels solid. It feels like you can have confidence in it that when you cycle it, it's gonna work every time and it's gonna load every time. Uh, the bolt here, the actual knob, you can remove it if you're not careful. I gotta put some Loctite on that. It's not a big deal. And actually Silverback comes with several different types of knobs you can buy. It's kind of oversized. I like it. A uh, quick note on that. It's actually quite easy to flip this over from left hand to right hand if you're a left handed shooter or a wrong handed shooter as, as we like to say. But you can, you can do that. It, it, they've built it so it's very easy to switch back and forth. Now let's talk about where the TAC-41P really shines. And that is and how easy it is to remove the cylinder. Now the cylinder is where you know, you do most of the work when you're taking on the sniper rifle and you're always going to be working on airsoft sniper rifles, always modifying them, always, always just doing your basic maintenance, changing out springs, modifying springs, just trying to get to sit as close to that field limit as possible. With guns like the VSR-10 or even the ANK M24, it's a, it's a lengthy process and kind of a pain in the ass. Like taking it apart and putting it back together, it, it takes a while and it can be very frustrating. Um, Silverback made this extremely easy. First off, the tools to do this come in the stock. They're underneath here. I pull them out and I'll leave them out just because I think it's dumb to constantly pull them out of the stock. And honestly, I'm never gonna do that in the field, so why would I leave them there? Underneath here, underneath the trigger, there's a gap right there. Put this tool and this pin, screw it a few times, pull it out. That's your pin. That's it. It's out. If you look right here at the cylinder, the cylinder head has a 
10 millimeter bolt face on it. So you got a 10 millimeter socket, put it on there, and you can unscrew your bolt. It's awesome. Real quick, real easy. Um, your internals, since we're here, and we can see how easy it is to do, I'm going to remove my cylinder head. There's your piston. There's your spring. There's your spring guide. Really well built. All these internals, they look great. Okay, and that's it. Whole thing's disassembled. Putting it back together. Spring guide. Spring. Piston. Cylinder head. And I'm gonna grab my socket. Screw it on. Don't even need my socket wrench. Done. Reassembly. Pull trigger. It's in. Pin goes back where it came from. On the trigger. Push it in. Unscrew. Done. That's it. That is awesome. Being able to work on that gun and switch out springs that quickly. So let's talk about performance. What's it shoot like out of the box? Well, it's incredibly accurate and incredibly underpowered. Uh, out of the box, this only shoots 1.3 joule. That's about 375 FPS using .2s. I put .28s in it. Um, I got excellent hop up on the .28s. Shot very straight, very flat, extremely accurate. Just not that much oomph on them at only you know 1.3 joule. I actually took it out yesterday, took it out to the field, played around with it a little bit, and I, I had a great time. It was really easy to hit targets. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to hit them very far away as I, as I would if I was shooting at the field limit, which is 2.8 joule. I'm not, I'm not even close to it. So 1.3 joule, basically I'm taking on AEGs in their range and I don't have the volume of fire because it's a bolt action sniper rifle. Obviously I was at a huge disadvantage, but the potential is there once I put a better spring in it, that it's going to be awesome. Now I tried modifying the spring. I tried using all sorts of spacers and shit. I tried to kind of cheat my way around that base FPS and try to get it up without buying the spring directly from Silverback. And uh, oh, well, that was a bad idea. It didn't work out. So I've ordered, I think I ordered a 150 spring and a 160 or something like that from Evike. The Silverback spring is proprietary. Just use the spring, use their springs and it will work well. So here's the question. We know this gun performs great at 1.3 joule. I got the new springs on the way. As soon as I install them, I'm gonna bump it up to 2.8 joule, the field limit, which is about 550 with 0.2s. Will it maintain that same performance and that same accuracy at 2.8 joule that we're observing here at 1.3? If it does, this gun is phenomenal. This is like the creme de la creme of airsoft sniper rifles, in my opinion, from what I've seen, and I've seen played with quite a few of them. I mean, it would be the absolute king. We'll see, but that's another video for another day. So um, in closing, first impressions of the Silverback TAC-41, um, I'm impressed and cautiously optimistic, and I think it's going to be a, a great gun, but, but we'll see. If you like my channel, you like my content, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. You guys know how YouTube works. Better yet, buy some of my merch. You can find my merchandise at unsavorytees.com. Go under Unsavory Army. Look at Gunfather Milsom and hit the little merch store icon. That'll bring you to my store. I sell all sorts of stuff. I sell slings. I sell t-shirts. I sell patches. In fact, recently, I got new patches. I have Flat Dark Earth Gunfather Milsom patches and OD Green Gunfather Milsom patches for all you green and tan Milsom guys out there. So these are six bucks. Run out and buy one now. Support my channel. Support my content. Thanks for watching.